Um, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, pleased to see I've only lost a constant fraction of the audience, so that's good. Uh, always, always good to see that you're still above 50%. So it's, it's a pleasure to have everyone back here today. Thanks for sticking around until the last morning. Today I'm going to continue the story that I was talking about yesterday. Um, and if we... Whoop, If my, uh... no, this is okay, I got it, yeah. Um, so yesterday, yesterday I tried to give you the background on what is known about both unregularized and regularized transport problems. Uh, and the message there, or a message there, was that the scaling of the unregularized problem is very poor in high dimensions, but the regularized problem, it turns out that at least asymptotically it enjoys much better performance, even when the dimension is large. So as I said, those results from the first lecture were mostly ones that were, were known as of a few years ago. And I want to try and tell you a bit about some improvements that we've been able to get to those results over the last year or two. Um, and a big focus in this talk will be on the correct forms of the central limit theorems for the objects that I talked about last time. So distributional limits for the objects that are actually centered at the right quantities and allow us to do inference not only on the distance, but also on the coupling itself. So these are, these are the results that I sort of uh, highlighted last time. So in order, the first one says that up to some huge constants that depend on the dimension and the diameter of the set, the expected gap between the regularized Wasserstein distance between mu and nu and the empirical counterpart, that shrinks at the rate n to the negative 1 half. And a similar argument uh, shows that we have a central limit theorem that's centered at the expectation of the empirical quantity. So here, I'm writing everything in the one sample case, by the way. It doesn't make a difference if I change new to new, but uh, just in the one sample case for simplicity. So here we have a central limit theorem. Again, centered not quite at the right place, but at least we have a central limit theorem without some of the aggressive conditions that Del Barrio and Lubez needed. And then finally, I actually want to say what this last thing is because I had to rush through it last time. So um, the last thing is that this object D, which is sometimes called the Sinkhorn divergence, this thing also shrinks at the rate n to the negative 1 half. So, so what is this D object? So this comes from the fact that one of the applications that was originally proposed from a statistical standpoint for the Wasserstein distance was for doing goodness of fit testing. We actually heard the words goodness of fit testing a lot yesterday. So um, this is the situation where I have a known measure mu, and I have an empirical measure nu n, and I want to test whether the samples from this empirical measure nu n, whether they come from mu or not. So that is to say, I want to test the hypothesis that mu is equal to nu. And so the way that this has been done in this framework of the Wasserstein distance is to, we can compute precisely this quantity, this w2 between mu and nu n. Um, and this goes to 0 under the null. And it goes to something non-zero under the alternative. And you know, several groups have analyzed tests based on this particular test statistic um, and argued for their usefulness in various high dimensional inference problems. So just as with if I have any metric on the space of probability distributions, it could give rise to a test statistic for, for goodness of fit testing. But several groups have advocated to use this object instead. However, as we talked about last time, even when mu equals nu, this convergence to 0 is very slow. Right? These are, uh, this is an asymptotic separation between the two hypotheses, but the gap that we need to consistently distinguish between them is quite large. And so it's natural, in light of the first line, to seek the same sort of thing, but using this regularized transport distance instead. So a question would be uh, if we can use this, this object in its place. Um, so this, we know, converges faster at the rate n to the negative 1 half. However, the issue is that this is no longer a metric. So when we added the regularization, we ruined the metric property. The problem is, at least naively, no, because s of mu mu is no longer equal to 0. This is easy to see from the definition of this regularized transport, because this is trying to optimize over all couplings between mu and nu, but it penalizes by their relative entropy. And that entropy term is going to be, you know, it's going to want to be 
uh, something non-zero in general. We're going to have to balance these two terms. So this thing is no longer vanishing at the null. As a result, Genevay et al. defined an alternative object which removes this bias. And so they defined this, which they called the Sinkhorn divergence, to be the original Sinkhorn divergence, which is this object I've been talking about, and then subtracting out these centering terms, which guarantees that when mu equals nu, that this whole thing vanishes. Um, and so there's this result of, uh, so this was, this was uh, Genève et al. here, uh, and there's a result of, of Fede et al. in 2019 that says that this thing, uh, it's not a metric, but it's the case that it equals zero uh, if and only if mu equals nu. So this thing acts as a sort of divergence, this is why it's called the Sinkhorn divergence, um, that allows us to discriminate between mu equals nu and mu not equal to nu. So this object is a nice object to use for the purposes of this sort of goodness of fit testing. Yes, Victor? Uh, so is, is it always non-negative? Yes, yeah. Not, that's not, uh, that's good, good question. This is always non-negative. That's not easy to see from the, uh, it's not obvious from the definition. Um, this was the first paper that proved that it was non-negative as well. Everything that they prove, you know, I've emphasized this several times in the compact support case, but I expect these results are still true uh, in the non-compact case. If it's convex, then it's automatically non-negative. Uh, okay, but the joint convexity of this thing is not, the convexity of this thing is not clear. It, indeed, but uh, the convexity here, I'm subtracting off these terms, right? So the convexity is not obvious a priori. Not to me, at least. Um, so this was one of the results of this paper, was that uh, this enjoys some convexity properties. I'm taking the difference of two objects, not obvious that it should be convex. Um, so anyway, I, I just, this was on my slides yesterday, but I didn't have a chance to introduce it, so that's, uh, that's the Sinkhorn divergence. So anyway, a consequence of the first line up here is that this divergence also shrinks at the rate n to the negative one half. And I previewed yesterday that I want some strengthenings of these results. Which strengthening should I hope for? What should I hope for in this situation? So to get some insight, let's examine what happens in the parametric case. So this was a setting that was investigated simultaneously by Bigot et al. and Klatt et al. Uh, in 2019, 2020. And by parametric case, what I mean here is where the measures mu and nu are assumed a priori to have finite fixed support. So I have a number of support points that's not growing with n. And so this finitely supported thing, this is now entirely a parametric problem. The reason it's entirely parametric is that a coupling between two finitely supported measures is just a matrix. And this matrix has rows and columns that sum to the correct values corresponding to the two measures on each side. But that's an object that we can think of in the purely parametric framework. And so, of course, because we're in a parametric setting, we have additional control. Um, and so these were the results, the much stronger results, that Bigo et al. and Klatt et al. were able to show. So. Um, they have that this thing in the parametric case satisfies a CLT with the correct centering. So this CLT we had before, but I don't need the expectation here. The centering is the correct one at the population level quantity. So that's good. Uh, Bigo et al. also gets second order asymptotics for this object. So notice that this object before, I claimed that this object was uh, of order at most n to the negative 1 half. What they show is that that's actually very conservative. In fact, when you multiply it by n, the result still has a distributional limit. So that this thing is of order n to the negative 1, in fact, and it enjoys this limit that's the sum of chi-squareds. So it has these sort of second order asymptotics that are familiar to us from various parametric estimation problems where we have a sort of uh, m estimation setting. So this, this is something that's nice and that they got. And the last thing, which is super cool and did not have any immediate analog in the continuous case, is that they actually showed that the coupling itself satisfied a central limit theorem. So remember I said in the parametric case, a coupling, this measure, is nothing but a matrix. It's just a p by p matrix where p is the number of support points involved. So I can think of this matrix as some finite dimensional object, and it turns out that this matrix itself enjoys a CLT. 
So there's a distributional limit for the coupling itself. That's actually, so this first result, uh, both Bigo and Clot obtained. The second one is due only to Bigo, and the third one is due only to Clot. But they have very similar techniques. So sort of both of these papers got to this idea at the same time. So we have a CLT with the correct centering in the parametric case. We have these second order asymptotics for the Sinkhorn divergence, and we have a CLT for the coupling itself. So returning to our situation, when you look at our results from last time, the same questions arise. Is it possible to get a CLT with the right centering? Is it possible to get the correct second order asymptotics for the Sinkhorn divergence? And do we have some sort of way of reasoning about an asymptotic limit for the coupling itself? All of these things were natural to hope for, maybe hope one could dream for them in context of the parametric case, but, um, but we didn't know what was happening in the continuous case. And so today, the, the main point is that I, uh, I'm going to tell you that there's a positive answer for all three questions. So even in the continuous case, or you know, the non-finitely supported case where I have measures with compact support, all three of these results hold. And so we get precisely the improvements that one would hope for on the basis of the finite case. Questions before I move on just on the, the motivation here and what sort of results we're hoping for? Okay. So the main tool, as I said last time, was duality. So duality is the, the basic idea that we used in the context of just proving the basic results. But it's going to be very important today. We need stronger control over the dual problem. So remind you that the primal problem looks like this. I'm penalizing by the relative entropy here with the squared cost. And that there's this funny dual formulation, which is unconstrained uh, and implies some nice things about the potentials. So one thing that I said yesterday is that the optimality conditions of the second equation, if you solve it, actually imply that the optimal solutions are infinitely differentiable. So they lie in Cs for any s. And um, as a result, these things have a, a ton of nice properties from a statistical perspective. Like we're working with smooth objects, which is really, really good. The thing that I didn't say yesterday, but which is even more important about this statement, is that there's a close relationship between the primal solution and the dual solution to this problem. And this is a little bit surprising from the perspective of standard convex optimization. You know, in convex optimization, we have the notion of a dual for many convex optimization problems. But it's rarely the case that we can move back and forth trivially between a primal solution and a dual solution. They satisfy some requirements, but I usually don't have an easy mapping between them. But the surprising fact is that actually the object that solves the first problem has a very easy expression in terms of the solutions to the second problem. So that is to say that this measure gamma, notice that because of the first line, because of this penalty, gamma is always absolutely continuous with respect to the product measure, mu cross nu. And what I'm telling you here is that its density with respect to mu cross nu looks exactly like the sum of the two duals minus the cost function. So this, this, if you've never seen it before, should be, should be quite surprising. I mean, this is an a unreasonably nice fact to have be true for this, for this particular problem. So I'm gonna, just going to briefly show you a proof of this um, just to convince you of where it comes from. OK, so the proof of this statement starts from a claim that I made last time, but I just want to emphasize again, which is that the optimality conditions for the two potentials, f and g, they, may, they have the following implication. So uh, the way I said it last time, uh, where did I put my chalk? So the way I said it last time was I said that the object that one differentiates under the integral sign, uh, well, it comes, it comes from this representation. So this was, this was the duality. I claimed that this was a property of the optimal solutions last time. This follows directly from looking at the first order optimality conditions of this convex program. So this is the way I wrote it last time. But if you want to rearrange this uh, and write it in maybe a way that emphasizes the symmetry between f and g a little bit better, you can exponentiate this and bring this to the other side. And you get that this is equivalent to this relation, that if I integrate this exponentiated function, f plus g minus the cost, 
against nu, I get 1. And exactly in the symmetric way, the same thing happens if I integrate this thing against mu. So that's what I've written on the first line here. If I take this function that I integrate against mu or take the same function and integrate it against nu, I get the constant function 1 either way. So um, this is a consequence of the optimality conditions. So what does this mean? Well, if you think about it, what it means is that this density that I've written upstairs this thing is actually a coupling between mu and nu. That is to say, when I integrate it in one direction, I get mu, and when I integrate it in the other direction, I get nu. And that's just because of an application of Fubini's theorem. So if I take this quantity and I integrate it first against mu, what this expression tells me is that the exponentiated term in the mu, they just integrate out to 1. So I just get the measure nu on the other coordinate. Similarly, if I integrate it in the other way, I just get mu. So that this thing is actually a primal feasible solution. That is to say, it was a valid choice for us to make in the primal problem. So it's enough to show, in order to show this optimality, it's enough to show that it actually matches the value of the dual problem. Because if I have primal and dual feasible solutions that match, they must both be optimal. So this thing is a member of this set. It is a coupling. And then if I compute the primal objective, this second term is now easy to handle. Because what is the relative entropy? Well, it's just the integral of the log density when I integrate against the measure gamma. And the log density is precisely f plus g minus the cost. So that if I like, for this particular choice of gamma, I can write this entropy term just in this way, as f plus g minus, minus the cost. Then the costs cancel, and we're left with this expression. And now I claim that this expression is the same as this one, which was our dual our dual criterion. And the reason for this? Well, it's precisely because gamma is a coupling between mu and nu. That was what I established on the first line. So that here I have something that's a separable function of x and y. So here, this first term is just like integrating f against mu. This second term is just like integrating g against nu. And then this last term vanishes, because the fact that this is a coupling means that this exponential term has to integrate to 1 which precisely cancels this minus 1 over here. In other words, I have in my hand a primal and a dual feasible solution, and their values match for the primal and dual problem respectively. Therefore, they're both optimal for their respective problems. So this calculation shows that there's this very tight relationship between optimal primal solutions and optimal dual solutions. As a result, if we understand the dual solutions well, we actually understand the primal problem as well. And that's, that's the trick that we're going to use. OK, so last time, the only fact that I used in order to get this n to the negative 1 half rate was the fact that the dual solutions were smooth, almost surely. So all I used was the fact that fn lies in this particular holder space for any s, um, almost surely. But that's a relatively weak fact about these things. And in order to get the results from today, we're going to employ two stronger facts. The first is that we actually want to show that not only do these things lie in the holder space Cs, but they actually converge in Cs to f at the rate n to the negative 1 half. So that is to say that the empirical dual solutions, the dual solutions to the empirical version of the program, these things converge to the population level quantities at the rate n to the negative 1 half in a rather strong norm, the C the S norm. So all of their derivatives converge uniformly at the rate n to the negative 1 half. The second thing that we're going to get, the limits for the divergence and the coupling, where I get these distributional limits for these objects, they come from a stronger statement, which is that not only is it the case that this quantity is stochastically bounded by something of order n to the negative 1 half, but actually when I rescale by root n, these objects satisfy a CLT in Cs. So again, this is a rather strong space in which a CLT is supposed to hold. Um, I want it to be the case that this, you know, I'm working in this Bonnock space Cs, which controls all the derivatives up to s simultaneously, and it enjoys a CLT in that space. So these are going to be the two additional facts that we need in order to get the results I claimed at the beginning. Not only does fn lie in this Bonnock space with probability 1, but actually it converges to f at the rate n to the negative 1 half, and when I rescale by root n, I get a CLT still. So those are, those are going to be the, the key ingredients to get these improved bounds. Yes, Victor. Um, I have two, two questions. First, the, the primal space, the space of the bounded uh, bounded 
Um, so, sorry, um, you're saying in the, when, I, when I write down the original problem? Well, oh. No, I mean, these, so, okay, um, I guess that I don't, I don't enforce directly that they have bounded support. I enforce that they're couplings between mu and nu. So if mu and nu both have bounded support, then this, this coupling will as well. But I don't put that uh, by definition into the program. In, in CS, you're saying? So it's because of this relation. So, so this relation here, so are you worried about the fact that I'm working on a bounded set, or you just mean generally? Generally. So this, I, I never proved this, but this is a one-line computation from the optimality conditions. This expression um, is an expression for f in terms of the optimal g, but I can differentiate this in x under the integral sign. Because this is actually, if I, if I look at this, this is an analytic function of x over here. So I actually can take derivatives of f, as many as I like, and they end up just being integrals on this side, you know, against some measure. And so I can bound all of these. So it turns out that the, the derivatives here really come from this integral representation, and this is manifestly infinitely differentiable. Uh, okay, but uh, so you, you see this only because you have this uh, explicit formula. Yeah. Nothing in principle. I mean, this is really special about this particular, um, this particular regularization term. So we're, we're relying very heavily on the fact here that we have this primal dual relation that comes from here. Um, it is not, you know, this, uh, somebody asked me this question yesterday. I should, have, I should have emphasized this. You know, in this max, we're taking the max over just L1 of mu and nu. So we're not taking the max over any regular functions. It just happens that they are regular. If I had another regularization term, there'd be no reason for the dual solutions to, be, to have any regularity a priori. Yeah, it depends on the, I mean, there are specific choices, but it, it, there's no general reason why this should be so. So, oh, sorry, the, yeah, yeah, please. the, the second question that related this in general, um, would it be useful <coughs> for this, um, trying to prove a CLT directly by using a functional down method for the space of measures? Okay, yeah. So. Um, so this was uh, in work that was essentially, uh, okay, so I don't know how to use that in the primal, but in the dual, that is doable. Um, so that's not the path that we took, um, but another group concurrently and independently of us proved a CLT in the dual where they just, they indeed established uh, Hadamard differentiability of the, of the dual in this holder space, CS, and then they use the functional delta method to obtain, um, to obtain a CLT in the dual. Uh, that method, there are pluses and minuses to both methods. That method is a little bit more technically uh, opaque in some sense, um, but either the, it's, morally, it's morally also possible to do that in the dual. I don't know of an easy way to do it in the primal um, because the primal, uh, you sort of, without using this dual formulation explicitly, the primal is not Hadamard differentiable in most reasonable norms on gamma. Maybe there's one that I'm, uh, uh, I'm not aware of, but it's not Hadamard differentiable with respect to some, uh, some interesting norms, I guess. Well, maybe that's not true, but it, I don't know how to prove a CLT in the primal via that method, let's say. Okay, I saw something, yeah? Yeah. And yesterday you mentioned um, the connection to, you know, like SDE flows. Is there any connection or interpretation? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so, not, there are some suggestive connections, but there's not a direct connection that I'm aware of. Um, let me say two things, which is that this expression, 
One thing it is connected to, which may have a connection to this SDE perspective, is that there was uh, Philippe Rigolet, Rigolet and I several years ago proved that this entropic optimal transport object corresponds to a particular, you can use it to build a, a maximum likelihood estimator, a non-parametric maximum likelihood estimator for Gaussian deconvolution problems. So this formula and the fact that you have something that looks like a heat kernel is related to the fact that this has some connection to estimators for Gaussian deconvolution problems, which is in itself a little bit related to this primal picture that I mentioned. Um, I'll also say that the perspective you offer, that this looks like some sort of heat kernel, um, this, is a, uh, this was exploited to great effect by uh, Max Fati and collaborators to, prove, to provide a new proof of the Caffarelli contraction theorem on the basis of entropic optimal transport. So there's a very, very nice proof along those lines that uses the interpretation that you mentioned. OK. Um, so uh, the, yeah, OK. So, so let, me just, let me just show you the, the improved CLT for this. First thing, this, this actually follows relatively easily, at least once you, once you have the right idea. Um, so this is the CLT we want to show before we had a CLT that had an expectation there in front. So in order to get the right CLT, the one with the correct centering, it suffices to show that the expectation is little o of n to the negative 1 half. Because then, when we rescale by root n, this thing still vanishes in the limit. And so in fact, for compactly supported <coughs> measures, what we were able to show is that this bias term actually decays at the rate 1 over n. So that um, this is what would be characteristic of parametric problems, that the bias is in, you know, one order better than the variance for this, for this problem. Um, the same result was, a, was obtained concurrently and independently by, by Rigolet and Strom. But essentially, the point is because this bias is small, smaller than 1 over n, that means that when we rescale by root n in the central limit theorem, the bias term completely disappears. And so we just end up with a central limit theorem that's centered at the right place. So the proof, of, the proof of this is very easy, though there's a, a computation that I'll show on the next slide that is, is quite hairy. Um, but the proof is exactly what I said last time, but just with more careful control. So last time, the way that I considered to bound this quantity was I upper bounded it by this integral. So I said that by optimality, I can essentially upper bound this by this object, which was related to an empirical process with respect to these holder smooth functions. That's what I said last time. If I want to bound the expectation of this quantity, therefore, it's OK for me to insert this mean 0 term here, which is what happens when I integrate the optimal potential f against this same quantity. So this is a standard computation that you would, um, that you would see often in the analysis of m estimators. Um, and then let me just apply Holder's inequality here. So in other words, what I have from this upper bound is that I have that I want to control the CS norm, the holder norm of fn minus f, and the dual holder norm of mu n minus mu. So this is just what I get from souping over holder functions. And of course, as I said before, if I choose s large enough, then this is a Donsker class, so that this term is of order n to the negative 1 half. So it's enough to show that this term is also of order n to the negative 1 half if we want to get this rate up here. So this is just a, uh, the, this proof just shows why if I can get control over this, this rate of convergence in the holder space, I can also get this 1 over n rate in terms of the difference in the bias. And yeah, OK, so, so the ultimate thing we show, the actual thing that's needed for this, is to show this fact, which is that the convergence of these estimators in the space CS takes place at the rate 1 over root n, or 1 over n when you look at the square distance. In other words, this object Fn, which is an m estimator, we want to show that it obtains the fast rate. So that when I look at the square distance between Fn and F in holder space CS, I want this to decay at the rate 1 over n. Now, this is a very familiar thing to everyone in this room, I'm sure. If you're looking at an M estimator and you want to show that it achieves the fast rate, you need to exploit the strong convexity of the criterion function. This is the normal way that we prove these sort of things. You localize around the optimum, and strong convexity allows you to guarantee that you get this extra factor of root n. So this would really follow directly from the strong convexity of the, uh, of the criterion function. And this is almost exactly what we need to say. The problem is that we're working in the wrong space. 
So it turns out that the criterion function here is naturally strongly convex with respect to the norm L2 mu. So L2 mu is you know, the L2 norm corresponding to the first marginal. Um, it's pretty easy to show strong convexity with respect to that. But this is not the norm in which we want to work. We cannot just afford to work with L2 convergence that's fast. We need to work with this Holder convergence that's fast, which is a much stronger norm. And so the main challenge is to show that for optimal solutions, it's the case that the Holder norm and the L2 norm are comparable to each other. So this is the main uh, computation that's needed in this. And uh, this is the thing that takes most of the, most of the, ugly, uh, most of the ugly work is to show that there's a comparison principle at optimality that allows us to bound all of these derivatives by things that just look like L2 norms, which of course should not be true in general. It's something special about this particular problem that the optimizers allow us for this type of control. So I'm not going to say anything more about this, about this proof, but that's the idea. It's a standard M estimation type result. Strong convexity implies a fast rate. And the only issue is to make sure that this argument takes place in the right metric. Um, because if we have the right metric, then we actually get the rate of convergence that we wish. We need to upgrade L2 strong convexity to CS strong convexity at the optimum. Yes, fine. No, just compactly supported. Yeah. So this is, this is why it uh, should be a little bit surprising, right? Like, why, why should it be the case that I am able to control this norm CS on the basis of just the L2 norm? And it's really because of these types of characterizations. So I can make these dual optimality conditions for F and G. They are allowed to hold over the entire space. And so I can, I can make these hold over the entire space, not just over the support of mu and nu. And when you look at this, what you see is I get pointwise control over f if I'm able to control some integrated quantity over mu. So somehow it's not surprising that if I stare at this equation hard enough, um, if I have good enough control over LP norms of various things on the right-hand side, I could actually extract pointwise control over f. And that's what we use. So because we have this optimality, we are able to get pointwise control over the derivatives just on the basis of L2 control uh, on, the original, on the original functions. But, but globally, it might be harder, right? Because of the log or? Globally, you mean if I'm not in the compact support case? Yeah, yeah precisely. Yeah, so this is the thing where we really use compact support extensively. Um, I mean, it's simply not true, by the way, in the non-compactly supported case that these things even lie in the holder space CS. You have to work in some sort of weighted holder space. Uh, and we actually don't know the correct weighted holder space in which to carry out these arguments in general. So, yes? So, uh, like, um, so like the proof you described like, of the fast rate was based like, on the uh, empirical process argument. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes also fast rates, they can be established using like, uh, convex optimization arguments. Uh, do you, I don't know if this makes sense in this context. So, um, what do you mean by a convex optimization sort of argument? I see, I see. So you sort of take an algorithmic view in order to prove this fast rate. That's a very interesting idea. That's not what we did, but, um, but it may be possible to proceed along those lines. And actually, the proof of this, I said that Rigolet and Strom achieved a proof of this result simultaneously. Their result is closer in spirit to a convex optimization proof, so perhaps it proceeds along the lines that, that you're imagining. Yeah, thank you. OK, wonderful. Um, so uh, for it turns out that, so back to the question about compact support, it turns out that we can make this CLT hold even under tail assumptions on mu and nu, that they're sub-Gaussian. But, um, but it's no longer quantitative in the, in the case where we have unbounded support. So in the compact support case, the way we proved this was precisely on the previous slide. We showed that the bias was of order 1 over n. So it's actually vanishing in the limit. Um, when the support is unbounded, we do not know any quantitative control over the bias. We just know that it's vanishing fast enough. Um, so here we use the fact that we have convergence in this space. Um, and here we need to use, OK, this CS is a little bit of a lie. But uh, so on compacts, so this happens sort of uniformly on compacts, where you look at the first S derivatives is the way to, to view this. Um, we do not know a rate of convergence. We have no quantitative control, but it's enough to get the CLT. 
So it would be good to make the unbounded support case quantitative, but we do not know how to do that right now. Okie dokie. Um, so now let me pass to this CLT for the coupling, which I think is the, the more surprising result. And let me first tell you the form of the CLT that I am interested in proving. So the CLT that I'm interested in is actually one that was conjectured by Asha Rilio and Paul in 2020. Um, and they conjectured the following, type of, the following type of claim for the empirical entropic plan. They said that basically it satisfied a CLT in a weak sense. So what they said is that for any test function that lies in L2 gamma, um, they conjectured that when I rescale by root n and integrate gamma, sorry, integrate eta rather against this, uh, this difference in measures, I get something that's a Gaussian on the other side. So this, this is like a weak L2 CLT of some sort. Um, there's no uniformity in this statement. Just says that for any particular test function eta, I get this type of limit. And the reason that they were interested in a CLT of this form um, was basically because it allows you to construct asymptotic confidence sets for some interesting quantities related to the measure. So one question you might have about a coupling is what proportion of mass is moved from this area to this area in the coupling? You know, how much mass sort of goes between segment A and segment B? That's something that I can estimate on the basis of the entropic optimal plan. This allows me to get a confidence interval for that particular question. Likewise, I might be interested in the average displacement direction. That's another thing that people have looked at. If I look at all of the mass that's moved between mu and nu, I can ask on average what radial direction this mass is moving in. That's something that I can get a confidence set for from this, uh, from this perspective as well. And the final example that people have used in the literature, just an ex as an example, um, so this paper by Klatt et al. that I mentioned, they were interested in the question of how much mass is co-localized in the coupling. So what that means is just what proportion of mass basically stays put when you, when you do this coupling. So if I set some small threshold tau, I'm interested in the amount of mass under the coupling that does not move between, by, by distance more than tau under this coupling. This turns out to be useful in various image analysis tasks that come up in biology. So this type of conjecture, it's nice because it allows us to do inference at the level of the plan. To go back to Victor's previous question, I do not know the right uh, formalism in which to obtain via the functional delta method CLTs of this form um, in the primal without working in the dual. But, but maybe it's possible to make this argument work. Would love to talk about it offline. Um, but this is the conjecture of Asherilio and Paul. What support do they have for this conjecture? Um, so they, they, by the way, I should say that they had the conjecture has an explicit, they, they conjecture what the variance is of the Gaussian on the other side in terms of eta, mu, and nu. So they have a particular conjecture for the form of the CLT that you get. This conjecture was supported by two things. The first is, of course, the intuition from the finite support case. We know in the case where we're working in the parametric setting that we have a CLT. So maybe it's nice to hope that this would be true in the general case. The thing that I find brilliant and amazing about their proof is that they actually formed this conjecture on the basis of a, a deep heuristic that I have no way of justifying, which is just that they proved that this CLT held for an entirely different object. Um, and this different object is something that arises from uh, maybe a different interpretation of the Schrodinger problem that started this whole entropic OT business, but it's just a different object. So they proved a CLT for that object and then conjectured a universality principle for this sort of class of problems that would include the entropic optimal transport problem as a special case. So they were interested in entropic OT. They didn't know how to prove it. They passed to this other object and proved a CLT for that thing instead and then conjectured that the same thing would hold for entropic OT. Some progress was made on this conjecture a year after it came out by Gonsilius and Xu who showed that the left-hand side was tight at least for each eta, so that um, there is, so that one has a hope of having a distributional limit here, but they did not identify the, the limit that arose from this, uh, from this particular procedure. Okay, so that was the conjecture of Asherwi and, and Liu and Pal, and the conjecture, it turns out, is true, that at least for compactly supported mu and nu, uh, it's the case that exactly this CLT holds with the, covariate, with the variance that was predicted by Asherwi, Liu and Pal. So their deep insight about this alternate object turns out to be exactly right in the case of entropic OT. They got the, they got the, uh, the variance exactly right on the basis of looking at this entirely other object. Um, 
And so this CLT, as I, as I previewed, this is really coming from a CLT on the dual objects that we then transform into a CLT on the primal by this primal dual relationship I said a few slides ago. So here's the, the thing to remember is that this function gamma, which is, if I write it as the density with respect to mu cross nu, this thing here links the optimal dual solutions to the optimal primal solutions. And so for notational simplicity, I'm just going to write this fx plus gy as this sort of direct sum operation, because really the thing that matters here is the sum of these two functions, not them individually. And the, uh, the main proposition that we need is that the empirical pair of potentials, they enjoy a CLT in this holder space, CS. So this is what was achieved simultaneously by Goldfeld and all. They are the ones who are using, uh, they use this uh, Hadamard differentiability of the dual objective to get this. We, uses, we use a different approach, which is sort of a standard Z estimation approach to prove CLTs. And the tricky thing is that you need to work in this space. So we need enough control to be able to say things about all the derivatives. And so we need a particular operator to be invertible uh, in this particular space. And that turns out to be the tricky thing, or a tricky thing, is just to establish enough control over this so that the operator actually is invertible in the holder space CS. But once you do that, it comes from standard ideas in Z estimation. Because remember, these are M estimators, right? And so the idea that they're M estimators should imply that we can get some sort of CLT as long as we have an invertibility of some sort of second derivative in, uh, of this M estimator. And that's the sort of object that we need. Now it's an operator on this holder space. But it's still possible to argue in exactly that way. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, basically. I mean, the, the, you know, we have some integral operator that arises when you look at the, um, when you look at the, you know, the, yeah, let's say the Fréché or the Hadamard derivative of this, uh, of this thing, and you need to show that that operator is invertible, and you need to show that the, um, you need to basically show that all of the machinery works out. But that's, that's basically what, what you need to do, exactly. Okay, great. Um, so once you have this CLT in the dual, like I said, then you're on easy street because I know explicitly a form for the primal solutions in terms of these dual solutions. So the CLT in the dual, that actually gives me directly the CLT in the primal. Um, so just to, just to emphasize this, if I take any test function eta and try and integrate it against this, uh, against this pair of measures, well, then that's basically the same thing as integrating some modified test function against this pair. So the, the primal, it has this pesky e to the negative x minus y squared in it, but that's the same between the two couplings. So I can just fold that into the function eta, and now I have here an object that looks very nice for me. This is the exponential of fn uh, plus gn against mu n nu n, and this is the exponential of the population quantities against mu and nu. And then this is easy to decompose. So I have something that looks like a difference between the potentials integrated against the population level measures. Then I have something that looks like the standard CLT that's just integrating this fixed function against this pair of measures. And I have a remainder term that doesn't matter. So it's enough in this case. This second term is always easy. This last term is negligible. And now that we have a CLT for the first term, we're able to establish that this has the same sort of behavior that we want. So, um, putting these three things together, that's what allows us to, to achieve this CLT in the primal. Again, it's a very simple argument once you have the correct expressions in the dual. I'll also say, by the way, that the, um, well, okay, let me, uh, let me go from here. So this, this is the proof of the primal CLT. And actually what turns out to be harder, but which uh, ends up still being true, is that we have this second order divergence limit as well. So that when I rescale by n, I get this weighted sum of chi squareds that shows up. When I look at any sort of compactly supported mu, um, I get this sort of limit. 
Uh, and this verifies partially a conjecture that Ushery, Liu, and Paul also made about the second order behavior of this object. So it's sort of, they, they made a more ambitious conjecture that we do not have a full proof of yet, but that basically characterized the second order fluctuations according to their perfect, their like heuristic object. So this partially verifies it, at least for the case of the divergence. Yes? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, they're the, they're the eigenvalues of some crazy operator um, that, uh, so I, I do not know of any explicit or tractable form of the right-hand side. We just know that it writes as this sort of weighted sum of chi-squareds. Uh, in, in the finite, uh, finite case, it was a finite sum? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Case? In the finite case, it was a finite sum, yeah. Here, here, not. here not, yeah. So we just know that we have, uh, some operator for which this is summable, and there is something here, but we, we don't know anything more than that. Yeah, these, the understanding what these operators are, I'll come back to this uh, in the last slide or two, it's a very interesting question, because um, right now we have no interpretation of them except that they show up in the proof. This same result, like I said, was, was also achieved by Goldfeld et al. because they have the same CLT that we have for the dual solutions, and the CLT for the dual solutions is really what matters here. Um, and the thing that I want to emphasize is actually that this is the place where the use of the holder space CS really matters. So I mentioned that Gonsilius and Shu, they had had the tightness of the limiting object that appeared in the limit for the, for the couplings. Um, they did also prove a CLT for the potentials themselves, but they proved that CLT in L2. And an L2 CLT for those objects, it turns out, is not enough, as far as we know, to get this result. You really need to work in this stronger space. So the, all of the technical work we had to do to get this CLT in this particular holder space, it pays off here, because we don't know how to get this except by using a CLT uh, in, in CS. How large do you choose S? Again. Uh, D over 2, greater than D over 2. Again, so that we have... Uh, um, you know, it's a nice space then. So we, we need this sort of Donsker behavior so that we can uh, get the CLT there. Okay, so um, some remarks about these results, and this, this goes back to the discussion I was just having with Victor about, about what these lambda i's are. So the variance function that shows up when you write down this coupling CLT, it's an interesting and complicated expression. And it turns out that the key player in this expression is this operator, which is the uh, inverse of the identity operator minus, so the adjoint of some operator A times applied to A. So A is this operator from L2 mu to L2 nu that's given by this expression. So, so let me just back up for a second. So take as a moment as a given that this is some operator from L2 mu to L2 nu. I'll tell you about it in a second. But you need to look at the taking this operator against its adjoint. When you do that, you get a self-adjoint operator from L2 mu to L2 mu. And the inverse of one identity minus this operator, that's the thing that shows up in the variance function. So what is this? Um, the thing that's interesting is that script A, this operator is a Markov kernel. So it's a, I mean, it's a Markov operator um, in the sense that it has a very natural interpretation in terms of the optimal coupling. It takes, it, it's the operator that arises from the following step in a Markov chain. Take a point x on the mu side, and then look at the conditional distribution under the optimal coupling on the nu side, and draw a point according to that conditional distribution. So A is what happens at the level that the operator on functions, L2 nu, when you do this step. So it comes from applying this Markov operator. So, a star A, this operator composed with its adjoint, is like taking a step forward and then backwards in this particular Markov chain so that you get from L2 mu to L2 mu. Now this object is very natural probabilistically. I mean, you know, we can, I just told you what it is. It's something that we can think about. But I have no idea why it shows up in this CLT. I think there ought to be a probabilistic argument that establishes why this type of operator is the thing you ought to expect when you look at the CLT. But as far as I know, there's no interpretation that's currently known. So um, I think that a very, and of course, it's some facts related to the spectrum of this operator, something more complicated, but composed with other stuff. But if we wanted to understand the lambda i's in the context of the 
the second order law for the divergence, we would need to understand this operator very well. Once again, I think that it's a natural probabilistic object, but I don't know how to interpret it really. I don't know why it shows up in the proof. So that would be something that would be very cool to know. Let me also just say that Goldfeld et al., because they establish via the functional delta method their results, that implies that, there's, that the bootstrap is consistent for, this, uh, for these objects as well. So in fact, there is bootstrap consistency for the potentials and for the plan. So you can do some sort of practical inference on these if you wish. The bootstrap will actually give you some asymptotically valid confidence intervals for this particular setting. Okay. So just to conclude, um, what I've tried to tell you about over yesterday and today are sort of some not so recent and some recent progress in understanding the statistics of entropically regularized optimal transport. We now know for this object essentially the sharp story, at least in the compactly supported case. We have the correct bounds on the bias. We know the correct distributional limits for the cost, for the plan itself, and for the potentials. And we know the second order behavior of this divergence term. So that in principle, we have a the basic story down if we wanted to use this for any sort of testing or inference task. On the other hand, there's still quite a bit to be done. I think that we're in very early days of understanding these objects. Um, and so I have some things that I think are really important questions for future work. So I would say that there are some improvements that may be merely technical, but may be actually really important to understand things. Um, so something that is probably doable, but we just haven't done it yet, um, is to obtain this CLT for the plan, but obtain it uniformly over some function class. So we can't get a uniform CLT over all of L2. That's too big. But probably we can, you know, any Donsker class, we can get a CLT over that class at the level of the plans. So this should be doable, but, uh, you know, just hasn't been written down yet. The more perhaps slightly more challenging technical improvement is the extension to the unbounded case and the extension to general costs. So in the unbounded case, I already mentioned this briefly, but um, we don't know the right space in which to make these arguments. So we should be working in some sort of weighted holder space probably, um, but we don't know exactly what space that is, and we don't know how to carry out the arguments there. So we're missing some key object, some key definition in which to make all of these arguments work in the unbounded case. The other thing that's possibly challenging but would be an interesting thing to understand goes back to this thing right here. So all along I've worked with W2 squared and with the regularized version of W2 squared. Now that cost is nice because the squared Euclidean cost is smooth. Right? This is a very nice object to work with. But if I work with a different cost, say the regularized version of W1, which just has the Euclidean norm rather than the squared Euclidean norm, then this expression pops up the exact same thing but without the square here. So I just get the Euclidean norm in this dual solution. In particular, I lose the regularity properties that were crucial for me before. I was applying the heat kernel originally, but once I remove this square, I do not have something that actually smooths out all the singularities of my object. So somehow everything that I was using, all of these smoothness estimates that allowed me to get the CLT, they fall apart under general costs. So there should be something that can be done uh, in the more general story, but it may be significantly more technical because you need to, you can't just use these derivative bounds. You have to work directly with some, with this expression and argue somehow that that constrains your duels enough to make these arguments go through. We don't know how to do that. So, the general cost case, particularly when the cost is not smooth, that is something that is still quite challenging. The more conceptual improvement that would be really nice to know, but which we really don't have any idea about, is what insights does this have for the unregularized problem? So we know that the unregularized problem, like I said, its performance in high dimensions is very bad. Um, but for the, regular, for the unregularized problem, we don't even know the right statement of any sort of asymptotic limit for the coupling itself. We don't know what that statement ought to be, where it ought to take place, what sort of object should be involved there. Ideally, if we had strong enough control over what happens when the regularization term shrinks, ideally we should be able to obtain some results that allow us to get some insight into that limiting problem. But we don't know how to do that. All of our dependence is really, really bad on this regularization parameter. It's exponential on the regularization parameter. So it can shrink only very slowly with respect to n. And as a result, we don't really have any non-trivial insights about the unregularized problem. 
Being able to push to that would be a really interesting topic that right now is outside the scope of the technology that we understand. So that's all I wanted to say. I wanted to tell you a little bit about these objects, impress upon you that there are some interesting things that are now being learned about them, and maybe show you some of the challenges that still remain. So thank you very much. Yeah, it's a great, uh, it's an excellent question. I mean, I think it would be, right now all of our arguments are a little too crude to get that, but I agree that in principle it's doable because the regularization gives us so many tools to work with. So it would be a, a, I think it's an excellent question. We haven't done it yet, but definitely something that needs to be done. <laughs> um, right, if I have an asymptotic limit result, uh, but I don't know what the distribution is out the other side, what am I doing? Um, very reasonable question. Um, I mean, the, I think that the, once, so once I know that I have a Gaussian limit, morally, and this is exactly what Goldfeld et al. do, once I know I have a Gaussian limit, in principle, the bootstrap will, will work. So, you know, there is, the fact that there is a Gaussian limit for this thing should give me some insight into what sort of techniques I can actually use for practical inference. But I agree, I do not have a, we do not have a way to use these limiting results to say anything in particular about a practical inference problem that we have. I, I completely agree. Well, I mean, I, I simply don't know what classical, whoop. I mean, to go back, this problem really came from um, trying to understand answers to questions that looked like these, right? I mean, if you think about what these biologists are doing, for instance, they are computing the entropic optimal transport problem involving these large point clouds. That is an estimator of something at the population level. You want to do anything at all to quantify the uncertainty of these objects that they have just written down. So if this object that they've written down is based on entropic optimal transport, any, any way of quantifying this uncertainty has to come from some sort of CLT at the level of the optimal coupling itself. So these are questions that biologists have asked about the couplings that they compute. And this is the only way I know of getting anything that is, you know, at least showing that in principle one can obtain confidence sets for these sort of objects. So yeah, I, I don't know other, other ways of getting confidence sets for these objects until you establish that some sort of CLT holds at the level of the plan. There are some problems that biologists are attempting and you want to get some answers. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, exactly. People are using estimators based on this already in practice. And so any sort of confidence intervals would be useful for allowing them to interpret their results. So, uh, one uh, particular practical issue is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the barrier center. So, so this is really a practical question. And so computing the barrier center is a step ahead because you have double optimization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. I don't know. Um, 
So the Berry Center, for those of you who haven't seen it before, is the object that minimizes. So you minimize over measures the sum of uh, this thing. So it's like a fresh A mean using this as your distance function. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in Berry Centers because they have a natural, they give a natural notion of average of a measure. And if you use the entropically regularized thing, you gain a lot of regularity, as Professor Spokoini has, uh, has already mentioned. Yeah, don't know. This is on, uh, on my to-do list to understand what's going on here. I don't know. 